Kevin B. Lee, I just call him Kevin, um, he's been known as uh, the king of video essays. That's from the New York Times. Roger Ebert, the late Roger Ebert, once referred to him as one of the brightest film critics working today. And UCLA Mediascape said Kevin B. Lee is undoubtedly the most prominent representative of the ever burgeoning group of video essayists. Um, currently, Kevin is a professor of cross media publishing at Mares Academy. Am I pronouncing that correctly? Mares Academy? Mares, yeah. Mares in Stuttgart, Germany. Uh, he's not calling us from Stuttgart. He's, uh, he's, uh, Cocooned in uh, in California, I think, with his mom, right? Yes, in my childhood bedroom. So. <laughs> <It's like laughs> more... but blasting that Guns and Roses, right? Is that exactly. what you're saying? <laughs> <laughs> you know, you gotta you gotta go back to the glory days. <laughs> Times and, like these. And another true confession here: uh, Kevin and I uh, worked together in, in what seems like a previous lifetime, uh, back when I was with the American Management Association, and. Uh, it's uh, always great to kef- catch up with Kevin. Uh, in a perfect world, we'd both be sitting at a bar with a with a cold one in our hands, talking about stuff. But this is the next best thing. Kevin, always great to see you, dude. You look a little tanned up there. You look good. Yeah, well, I'm trying to find safe, sunny places to sequester myself because it is it is important for us to not be glued to our screens all the time. I mean, this is something I've definitely experienced with my students. Uh, you know, we've kind of migrated to this. Uh, online teaching environment. Mm-hmm. Um, I think that's something we wanted to talk about. Yeah, how's that, that work? How's that working out for you? What, what are you and your your other you know faculty peers? How how are you feeling about the efficacy of uh, online education? Yes, well, it is too early to tell. I mean, we've kind of globally embarked on this grand educational experiment. Like, how do we learn uh, online? How do we kind of provide? The, the kind of services and the quality of learning experience that we've had with the classrooms. Mm-hmm. And, you know, just to bring a bit of our own mutual background, Dave, you know, we, we were seen, I think it was like 12 years ago. Oh my God. Yes. Years ago. Long, I know we go, we go ago. that far back <laughs> when, uh, when there was the financial crisis mm-hmm. and um, suddenly virtual and remote solutions, digital solutions were seen as kind of like the opportunity mm-hmm. that we had to seize upon right. uh, to survive, if not thrive right. uh, as, as a business. So we, we were making webcasts and podcasts. So it does mm-hmm. feel a little bit of deja vu all over again. Um, and so I, I, it's really benefited me a lot to have that background mm-hmm. and that experience mm-hmm. with you. Right. Uh, yeah. That said, um, you know, it is also useful to be skeptical. Yeah. I remember one thing from that experience uh, was that, you know, you can have these webcasts, podcasts, and virtual solutions, but they are not the solution in and of themselves. Mm-hmm. And there, at the end of the day, there really is no true substitute for being in a physical space with somebody and really having, there, there's definitely something about sharing a presence with, with someone. Right. And um, yeah, and, and even just like what it does to you uh, physiologically, like uh, sure. neurologically, to be like spending so much time in front of your screens. Um, I've, I've definitely been getting feedback from students like where where certain teachers are insisting that you teach a class, a three hour class that normally would be three hours in a classroom mm-hmm. are now is now three hours on Zoom or Microsoft Teams. And to have students kind of stare at the screen that way. That's yeah, brutal. Um, yeah, especially especially when it's this kind of traditional unidirectional lecture format Mm -hmm. where the student has to just kind of listen right and there is no kind of feedback channel and this reminds me of you know some of the things we we adopted with our webcast we Mm -hmm. really wanted it to be interactive right to be engaged uh so you know you need to have those kind of call outs built in right just kind of check in ping your uh, your audience ping your student students make sure that they are taking what you're wanting to give them sure but uh, I've also learned from this experience that there is a question of scale that needs to be taken into account. Mm-hmm. So, for example, if you've got like, at you know, 15 to 100 students in a class mm-hmm. uh, and to lecture to them live, uh, it, it's just not a very um, mm-hmm. satisfying proposition mm-hmm. because of those dynamics that I was just talking about. Sure. So in that in that case, what I normally do is I'll just pre-record a video. Right. Um, so I'll do a video lecture or a video essay, which mm-hmm. I've, you know, done, I've had a lot of experience with, 
And so that gives them what we call an asynchronous mm -hmm. uh, access because then they don't have to be locked in on my kind of live monologue. Sure. They can actually access this anytime that it's convenient for them. Because sure. when you want to have a live experience, it's much better to do it in a smaller group. So, yep. so I only uh, have meetings with like three to five students at a time mm -hmm. uh, live. And then I can really address them individually, have a really good discussion amongst us. And, and that really provides a, a richness and quality experience that uh, I think um, is the closest to replicating that classroom intimacy. And you were the person who was uh, always sort of, you know, um, imbuing a lot of your video essays with, you know, the logic and the story and the feelings and context. And um, I get the feeling that uh, you, you, on one hand, probably see some value in what we're doing with the screens and with the stuff, but, but do you have, I mean, I don't want to blame you for this, Kevin, but, but you know, this, there's a rapid evolution happening right now. Do you have mixed feelings about how much of this is online now? Right. Right. So you're, you're outing me as the I'm sorry, but I got it. I'm, bur I'm burning you, man. I'm burning yeah, yeah. you. <laughs> well, it was, yeah, it, it definitely takes me back to the good old days, Dave, when, uh, you know, we, we worked at the, um, this production studio together and you know i don't know how much of this you you caught on or how much i i kind of uh confessed to you i mean i was a pretty frustrated independent filmmaker mm -hmm. at the time just trying to make my way and it was around that time that youtube was coming yep. into its own and so to have access to you know digital resources network resources it was a tremendous opportunity for me so i kind of come from a certain moment, sure. a certain generational or historical moment where, yeah, I, I saw this as a huge boost for me and I embraced it and I went sure. with it. And uh, so, so to that extent, I'm grateful. Um, and you see that even more today. Sure. I mean, you, 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 you kind of were giving those accolades in the intro, but those accolades are several years old. And since got, then- Got to update your LinkedIn <laughs> profile, man. <laughs> right, I got to- <laughs> Because I gotta, I gotta keep up with these kids. I mean, in the in just the last ten years, you know, the the stakes just get accelerated and raised, and uh, kids coming out of the the crib are able to edit videos right. I know. with such dexterity, right. and, and they're really born into this environment. Sure. So, you know, it, it, for me, it's really at this line of like, well, yeah, I I've become increasingly concerned, and what I was describing just now about. The physiological effects of just being on the screen all all the time and just being able to, um, yeah, be aware of what it's doing to you sure. neurologically, psychologically, sure. and look for alternatives, not see it as as the be all and end all. Right. But at the same time, there there are ever like new uh, new generations of people. I know. Who, are just kind of their brains are just sort of neurologically I wired know. to adapt <laughs> this environment. It, de it definitely. You know, it makes you wonder yeah. because yeah. It's, it's not really relatable. I'm going to, I'm going to, in the time we have remaining here, I'm going to, I'm going to ask you the question I ask everybody, which is, um, Kevin, what lessons are we learning right now that we must not forget? Yeah. Well, yeah, maybe I am kind of aging myself or becoming aware of my age because, you know, when, when you tell, ask me this question, my first answer is, yeah, we kind of need to slow down and take stock of things, you know, and <laughs> given that, uh, so much of my uh, kind of rise career-wise was embracing mm -hmm. the accessibility, the convenience, and the speed mm -hmm. that these digital technologies have afforded us. Uh, suddenly, this this global pandemic has made me realize the need to stop, and I've really <laughs> appreciated. I've really appreciated this this hard stop. Um, yeah. You know, as, even though it's been uh, economically and and um, you know, health-wise, just devastating. Yeah. Uh, it, I think it's also been a necessary wake-up call and yeah. kind of like, you know, the, the the moment where the needle rips on the record and we're I like, know. okay, let's let's really take stock of yeah. where our society is going. And uh, yeah, maybe, maybe there needs to be a reorienting around a, a different set of values. Right. Slowness, intentionality, uh, critical thinking, critical awareness, mm -hmm. and also a a greater embrace of science, <laughs> scientific facts. That's great, and not not just going with like the things that uh, satisfy you and what right. you you know what you want. So cool. yeah. All right, look, we're out of time here. Um, so great to see you again. Let's not wait too long before we do this again.